This is the Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 21st chapter. He looked up and saw rich people putting their gifts into the treasury. And he also saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in all she has to live on. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Um, so, Pastor Connie just took half of my introduction. Um, <laughs> my name is Amy thompson Savimley, and I am thrilled to be here with you this morning. As she said, um, I serve as assistant to the bishop in what's called the Synod Office, which is just another way to say that I'm a Lutheran pastor who works for the Office of the Bishop in this area. Um, so if you didn't know it, you're part of a Synod, which is like a regional area of congregations. And you, there's a bishop um, who uh, has oversight for that synod, um, and you're part of the Metropolitan Washington, D.C. Synod, though I will tell you you're very close to the line with the Virginia Synod, which is, runs right through Quantico. Um, but you are part of the Metro D.C. Synod, and so I bring you greetings on behalf of the Reverend Richard Graham, your bishop, and the nearly 35,000 people in this area who also attend other congregations of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right, great. Um, now, as uh, Pastor Connie said, some of you know me because I've been here before. Um, I've been here for a couple of years of time. Um, and so it's good to see some familiar faces. But what's more <coughs> exciting to me than even the familiar faces are all the new faces who are here. Because as I began to work with this congregation and get to know the congregation, um, we worked together to think about how it would be that God could call new people into this place. And so I am thrilled to see the way the people of Christus Victor, now River of Grace, have worked together and let God work through them to prepare the way for not only the familiar faces, but all of the new faces who are here. Um, this is a place that is a very special congregation. It is filled with special people, with an amazing kind of leadership at its core that I have known now for years, and with a very special pastor who is very faith-filled. She's a lot of fun, and it is an honor to serve with her and to know her and to learn from her. And I am grateful for the opportunity to preach here this morning. So as we get started, the question that I want to start with is the question of what would you do if you weren't afraid? Now, uh, this is a question that has come up most recently in a book I've read, but you've probably seen this in different venues. My brother actually has this on a paperweight that sits on his desk. What would you do if you weren't afraid? I've encountered this question most recently in a book um, by Cheryl Sandberg. Some of you may be familiar with it. The book is called Lean In. And it's particularly about women and their workplace and why they may or may not um, end up in positions of leadership. And what she really advocates for in that particular book is that women would really throw themselves into their work um, and so that they would come into positions of leadership. She says there are a lot of things happening in society, but one of the things that women can do is really throw themselves into the work that they're doing. But she begins the question, she begins the book by asking this question specifically to women, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And it's a question that pertains to anybody, not just women. But it's a question that is particularly interesting given our gospel lesson this morning, in which we meet a woman, a widow, who is uh, in a particularly vulnerable position in life. Um, it's important to understand that in the first century, when this, this story would have been written, um, or when it would have been the, the story is told about from the 21st chapter of Luke, 
It's important to understand that widows were particularly vulnerable people in this society. They were women who would have been married, um, but who would have uh, lost the support of the marriage and their husband when the husband died. And if this woman had no children, then she really had no support. She would have no one in the world to support her, and she would probably have nearly no money. Um, and so one way maybe to think of her uh, in a context that we'd be familiar with would be to think of her as a single homeless woman who didn't have money or children or anyone to support her. And we meet this woman today in the temple. Jesus is watching people put their offerings into the treasury. And um, these offerings would have gone for care of the priests and for the ritual sacrifices that happened in the temple. And this woman comes, and she, everyone knows she's a widow, and I, probably you could see that about her. She had nearly nothing to give. And she had two small copper coins, the text says. And she puts in not just one, but two. She puts in the text says all that she has to live on. Now, of course, she could have held one back. She could have kept it back just in case she needed it, I suppose. But for whatever reason, or as she was, she decided to throw in both. She gave out of her poverty in this particular case because she trusted that giving would make a difference and that God would take care of her, and that God would make a way for her, even if she didn't know what that was. She didn't throw half-heartedly in what she had, but she was literally fearless. She threw away her fear, and instead she threw in all of her money to the temple treasury, making herself not dependent on what little she had, but really trusting in God, trusting that God would make a way for her. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that when people who live in this time and this place hear a story like this, they are, or we are, possibly surprised. Maybe we stand a little bit in awe of this, but also a little skeptical that this would be possible for a time and a place such as ours. Try as we might, and as well-intentioned as we may be, I think it's really a rarity these days for a person or even a group of people to really go all in, to put, throw themselves completely into something, not just to throw in one coin, but two. And it's hard to know, really, whether the sacrifice will be worth it, whether all of the time and money will really make a difference. It's hard to know whether throwing in everything and risking potentially having nothing at the end will really make a difference. And I'll tell you that in my work with congregations, I see congregations all of the time who are skeptical they of really throwing themselves into something. They say that they would like to have change, but when they realize what that's going to mean for them, they're not always ready or willing to really throw themselves into the church. And so when I go around to congregations and I work with them, we have, a, a, we have conversations about what would it take, what would it really take to throw away their fear and put their trust in God, that God would find a way. And I have not met many congregations that are willing to do that. But I will tell you that when I go around to other congregations in the Synod, there is one congregation that I lift up every time we have this conversation. And it is yours. It is River of Grace Lutheran Church. <coughs> I have found in my work with you over the past couple of years that this congregation is an example of the kind of trust that we see in this particular text. I think River of Grace and his leadership, your pastor, are just about all the way in. Now, if you've been here for a while, you may know this. But if you're new, you might not know all of this. You might not know the story. So I'll just tell you a little bit about my experience in the last couple of years. Not long ago, this was a struggling congregation. It had really dwindled over time, and the former pastor was leaving. And when that happens, typically congregations call the synod office. They call the bishop's office. 
So we get a call. The, the former pastor is leaving. The congregation is not sure what they're going to be able to do, whether they're going to be able to make it. And so the bishop sends me here. And I will tell you that at my first worship service, which was in the fall, I believe, of 2011. Does that sound right to people? Yeah. Um, anyway, about two years ago, I came in, and there were a total of 21 people here. When we started worship, there were about 15 people, and slowly over time, you know, people trickle in. Some of us are notoriously late. That would be me. Um, by the end of the worship service, there were probably about 21 people here, including the children. Uh, and I found that as I talked to people and I got to know people, people were in, I mean, some of the most gracious, kindest, most loving people I had ever met. They were tired. They were exhausted. Some of you know what I'm talking about. There was a spirit of exhausted love that permeated this place. There was a little bit of frustration. And as I came to get to know the people at here at River of Grace, then Christus Victor, they knew they needed to do something different. And they knew that it might need to be drastic. Now I'll tell you again, I meet a lot of congregations in this situation, but many of them are not willing to make the kinds of changes that are needed to really begin to be a place where God can work in and through them for something new and something different. But this congregation, for whatever reason, was willing to really cast out fear and place its trust in God. This was clear to me the whole way through that the people who were gathered here were people of faith and people who were willing to trust in a way that I really don't see very often. And this is a place that has always been, in spite of the hard times and the hard conversations and the hard decisions, always been a place that has been willing to cast out fear and to trust God to find a way. And today is a great example of that. Amazing things are happening here. The fact that there were, I believe I counted 18 children during the children's sermon, I took a picture and I just texted it to the bishop. I said, this is the children's sermon at River of Grace. I was downstairs during a, a Bible study this morning, and I heard stories of the way that people are being changed, the way their lives are being changed, the way their characters are being changed. Anxious people who will feel calmer, who feel a sense of God's presence in their lives because of their experience here at River of Grace, in among you as people of God gathered in this place. Every time I come here, I meet people who come and tell me about the way their lives are being changed here. Last time I was here, a couple of, uh, months ago, three different people came up to me to tell me a story about why this congregation was so important to them and how God was active in their lives as a result of their presence here. So these are the kinds of stories, yours are the kinds of stories that I lift up when I go to other places. When people ask me, how is it that this congregation can connect more deeply with people? How can we help our neighbors know the love of God? When pastors ask me, how can I make the relationships that I have with people have Christ at the center of them? I say to them, have you talked to the people at River of Grace Lutheran Church? Have you talked to Pastor Connie Thompson? Do you know where they've been and what God is doing them, you are a beacon of light and hope, and I hope you know that. Now, I don't want to sugarcoat this. I've been here for some hard conversations. I know it's hard. It's not perfect, and it can get exhausting at times. I know people here don't always get along, and sometimes they don't even always like it, and sometimes people even leave. Sometimes, I imagine it can feel like two steps forward and one step back. And I suppose it's exactly in those kinds of times when you begin to wonder whether it's really worth it. Whether all the time and the sacrifice is really worth it. When it begins 
when you can begin to wonder whether you should be a little less fearless and a little more fearful than you have been. Whether you should really go all the way in or whether you should start holding something back, just in case. And my sense is there are probably some people here who are asking that question. It's been 18 months. As we say, sometimes the honeymoon period wears off. Your worship numbers have grown beautifully over that time, but the money still lags a little bit behind. And it might begin to feel like some people are holding one coin back. Even you're wondering whether you should be holding one coin back, whether you should really go all the way in. And so this is what I would say to you this morning. If you're holding one coin back, whether it be from this congregation or from any change that you think God is trying to make in your life right now, this is what I would say. Throw in that second coin. Go all the way in. Because God won't fight with the coin that you hold back. God won't fight with whatever it is that you want to hold back. If you think you need to control your time, or your enthusiasm, or your money, some kind of your abundance, God won't fight with that. But if you don't give it to God, God won't be able to grow anything new in you either. If you don't trust it to God, God can't do more with it. And I think God wants to. I think God is doing a new thing here. I see over and over, every time I'm here, new people, new lives change because of what God is doing in and through this place. God is already at work here. And if you offer more, if you're willing to go all the way in, I believe that God will continue to work more. God will find a way. But it's going to mean that you're going to have to take the next step. That you will have to throw in whatever it is that you're still holding back. Your heart, your time, your emotions, your support, your enthusiasm. Or maybe even, because it's the case for most of us, your money. I know this is your stewardship season right now. And so you're talking specifically about money. And if it is literally a coin that's holding you back, throw it in. See what God will do. What God can do with this place and what God can do with you. Because when you give to God, the possibilities of what God can do in and through you are enormous and amazing. And I look forward to seeing what will continue to happen in this place if you do that. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.